Welcome to Halting Towards Zen, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are continuing our discussion of the Ten Commandments and their influence on Western society. Last time we covered the first five, so we'll pick up with number six. Number six would be, let's nix killing one another. Did you learn that song <laughs> as a child? Never. No? Never heard nope. of it till okay. this second. <laughs> <laughs> nix? Really? <laughs> let's let's nix, because it rhymes with six. The options are limited. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So thou shalt no. not murder, being uh, the actual do, text. <laughs> thou shalt do no murder, yes, as our Lord interpreted it. Uh, the, the Hebrew word has the idea of don't slaughter things that can be slaughtered. So, yeah, murder would be closer than simply the idea of not killing. Don't do the kind of killing you're not supposed to do. Which is sort of tautological, but before before we proceed with that, you know, this might be the obvious place to say why this is this is about history. Why are we doing this? I mean, what what really? Thou shalt not kill. Everybody knows that one. <laughs> All cultures have they, observed they that. Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Neg- negatory. <laughs> negatory. Red Rider. Mm. Uh, and, and so with the others, don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness. Everybody uh, knows that now because <laughs> of the Ten Commandments, <laughs> way back at the beginning of Western civilization. The, 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 thing is, the thing is that even theologians today, and, and some of them claiming to be Reformed, will tell us that these things are written in the human conscience, and although it, the conscience may be a little shabby, a little be, be a little imprecise, in general, basically, all men know these things. I mean, this is natural law. We know we should not kill other people. We know we shouldn't take other people's property, break up their marriages. We should tell the truth and such. Uh, and and it's it's kind of within some circles, it's almost become a shibboleth of how how can you insist upon bringing the Bible out into the civil sphere when everybody knows these things. They may not do them, but everybody knows that the things the Bible forbids here are wrong. And um, what, what, aside from negatory and such, (laughs) do you have specific examples of where where people, cultures, societies, institutions in our day? or in the last thousand years, have rejected these basic commandments in favor of some other approach to life mm-hmm. and living. Yeah, I'll, this is anecdotal. Someone might argue that this is an isolated incident. I would argue that it's not. <laughs> um, but I was at a swing dance conference um, with a friend um, and somebody else that we knew, and we were all going to lunch. And this guy just drops into conversation very casually. Well, I believe in polyamory. <laughs> and we're like, um, what? <laughs> you just drop that into conversation? So like, no, it's it's not taken for granted that people believe in being faithful to a spouse. Um, it is not taken for granted today. I can tell you that. I think divorce rates um, mm-hmm. might bear you out as might the regular incomes of... Um, professional prostitutes Mm -hmm. and the soaring rates of pornography in the United States and abroad. Mm -hmm. No, this is not something we take for granted anymore. But surely everyone knows you shouldn't kill people. No. Thoughts? (laughs) There are lots of people who think it's okay to kill children before they're born. So, well, and I have been recently working through a, a book called Love Thy Body by Nancy Piercy. And she spends a lot of time on this, on the abortion issue specifically with the argument of, well, you're not allowed to kill a person, but people have to qualify to be people. Mm. And so if they don't qualify by my standard, so it's not, they've, they've gone past the, okay, we realize biology actually does tell us life begins at conception, but life is not the defining thing. You have to be a person Mm -hmm. and have certain characteristics. And so we can kill up to a certain point and of course, everybody has a different definition of life and value and all of those things. But 
even in on the other end, you also see this in the euthanasia discussions mm-hmm. of people don't have enough quality of life. Life is not what they want. Therefore, they can kill themselves. Um, or someone th- can do it for them. Mm-hmm. Right. Or that, I mean, think of, I've had to read so many books and see so many movies where they're basically manipulating you to feel bad for the person who has committed these sins mm-hmm. because their circumstances push them into it, or they had a loveless marriage and so, or they had a really horrible spouse that abused them. Therefore, they were okay to kill that person or to cheat on that person or steal from that person. Um, All of these things become justified because we say, well, the circumstances allow it or my feelings Mm -hmm. or my logic even can prove why this is beneficial. Um, And since both our feelings and our logic are sinful, they can always prove sin right if you let them go without the Bible. And this is widespread in Western countries where I think it was Iceland where they claimed to have eliminated Down syndrome when in fact they had just killed all the people with Down syndrome. Yes. They they basically aborted all of them. And so they have none. Yeah. I think it's Denmark. That's a new one for me. Is it Denmark? Okay. But it's it's one of those. Scandinavian. um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. socialized medicine, very nice and proper society. Loving. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, and see, that's the thing. Is it not loving to put these children out of their misery before they go through a whole life being dependent, needy, not enjoying the quality of life the rest of us do? And how about the burden they are on society and the poor people who have to take care of them? They didn't bargain for this when they set out to have children, they were looking forward to something wonderful, and look what they got, and so on. This reminds me, somewhat tangentially, of um, Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Oh, yes. (laughs) Whereby he he says to Parliament, you guys aren't willing to do any of the basic things to take care of the poor in Ireland, so let's make them profitable. We can turn them into baby-making machines, and we can sell the babies as meat and as you know gloves and all this, because clearly that would make them more useful, because you yes. don't think they have any value. So let's make them valuable. Of course, mm-hmm. he's being very satirical, but it's that same idea of anything horrible can be made useful and justified. And it's such a lie that a life that contains pain or hardship, or sorrow, is therefore not worth living. Mm-hmm. Because I think yeah. Jesus was called a man of sorrows. <laughs> and that was actually the whole backdrop for his salvation for us, was he went through all the suffering, and it was needful that he do that. So, turning now back to the Ten Commandments, we look at things that people may say at first glance, well, yeah, everybody knows that. Everybody does that. Everybody believes that. But when you start pressing, as you ladies have just done, all right, you should not kill, should do no murder. Well, you remember the the lawyer who said, well, who is my neighbor? Here maybe the question is, and what is a life? Mm-hmm. What what Who are the people we should not kill? What makes them non-killable? What makes them people? What makes them truly a person as opposed to simply some kind of animal life form. Um, with with so many of these things, there are, but what if, as you said, uh, till death do we part? Well, then that means I can arrange your death, I suppose. Um, wouldn't it be nicer, though, if we just went our separate ways? Uh, I can be faithful to you and still have a girlfriend and uh, visit prostitutes and so on. Yeah, this is just how I get my kicks in, in marriage. You should be happy and submit to this brutal kind of treatment. And, and we go on stealing. No, you should not take my stuff. But how about if you uh, vote someone to office and they move the government to take my stuff, confiscate my stuff, my money and, and spend it on you? Is, is that okay? Under what circumstances, where, where are the limits of this? Uh, Thomas um, Sowell, 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 how do you pronounce it? Sowell, uh, wrote a wonderful book um, about uh, worldviews, about vision. Mm-hmm. And he's defending the um, 
what we would think of as conservatism, more or less, over against the liberalism of Romanticism and the French Revolution. But it was interesting when he got to the point of, but of course, there are some places where the individual does have to give up his property rights for the good of the society. What? <laughs> <laughs> Where Why is the qualitative do? difference? Yeah, what? <laughs> what? Who decides what's good for society? Yeah, mm -hmm. once you've got there, uh, there's a problem. Uh, I was teaching um, Sunday school one morning and was talking about the, the state does not have the right to take your stuff and 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 spend it or use it for the communal good unless the Bible clearly grants that as an option. And one gentleman who should know a whole lot better. I was I, I was rather stunned that this this particular man raised this objection, and I just sort of let it pass, not wanting to um, attack him in front of the congregation. But he, he basically said, "Well, but that certainly doesn't apply if." And he gave particular cases where, well, here's this community; it's just kind of sprung up and grown, and without any thought, and the water it needs is over there, and the only way to get the water to it is by passing it through your land. Surely the state can take your land then. No, <laughs> I, uh, my reply was. We have several uh, objections to yeah, such a prospect. Uh, due process uh, for one. Yeah. So that's what does the it, it, yeah basically I said if you can find something in the Bible that supports that, great. I'm not aware of any such thing. And then he, put, he put forth another example. I don't remember what it was, but it was that kind of yeah. well. The, isn't it obvious that the goods, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one? But there's also the no. assumption <laughs> that whatever they're proposing is the only way, which yeah. is something people do all the time to oh, justify yeah. bad decisions. Well, it's like, well, if it's the only way, you know, if I'm in these dire circumstances, no. and often the necessary follow up is, are you really in such dire circumstances? <laughs> yeah. Or what poor planning sometimes puts you there. Because if a town sprang up without a source of water, maybe they should have been on it move. before they started yeah. settling there. Yeah. Or maybe some entrepreneur can show up and find a way to get water to them. Like that's mm. anyway. And if they can't, well, you know what? Tough. That still doesn't mean you get my stuff. You don't get right. my property. You don't get my property because you picked a rotten place to live. Mm -hmm. But how do we get there? We, 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 we look at the basic thing and we think, we, we say, we all agree to this. And then little by little, we whittle away at the edges and we keep whittling, we keep whittling, we keep making exceptions. We keep putting in special circumstances until the thing is for all, pr all practical purposes gone. You, you, I can't steal from Walmart, unless it's under a thousand dollars, then I can walk out the door and they can't do anything. I can't uh, steal from my neighbors to finance a new library, but I can get the government to do it. You, you go down the list of things. I can't take my my neighbor's guns away, but I can get the government to make laws forbidding him to have any. Mm -hmm. And so we we go down the list of here's how this area that we perceived as not simply a law, a commandment, but an area of freedom. Something valuable that, that the law protects, and we see it whittle away because there is no true commitment to the principle. There's a vague awareness that somewhere in here there's something that at one time a lot of people considered valuable, and I can even see that under certain circumstances it would be valuable, but not when my needs, my perspective, my wants are getting crossed by that. Then, then it becomes very negotiable. Uh, what's mine is mine, which yours is yours until I need it. And so with each of the commandments, it's the, the world does not agree. There is no common law of nations. Uh, Deuteronomy tells us that every wickedness, every perversion that the wicked have come up with, they have used in the service of their gods. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a worldview that has shaped Western civilization, and it is in this, this, the second table of the laws, it's sometimes called the last five commandments or so, depending on how you want to slice and dice them. It establishes these things. One, that human life has a value that transcends other sorts of life forms, other needs, other possibilities, other pleasures. We are simply not to take people's lives unless 
the law somewhere else justifies it. And really, the only justifications are immediate self-defense or fighting in a war under the authority of appointed magistrates or being a executioner under such magistrate. That's that's pretty well it. If there's not someone in your room and it's dark at night who might have a gun, we shouldn't be killing people. Um, it's Or you're a magistrate who's been appointed to uphold the law. As a private individual, otherwise, we're just not to kill people. It's It's really that easy. And sometimes that hard because, you know, life gets a lot easier for some people if you can kill other people. It just makes life so much. I get richer because of inheritance. I'm unburdened because I don't have to take care of my crippled son. Uh, I uh, My emotions are not hurt by having to look at this poor deformed baby or this slowly decaying grandmother. I can just make myself feel lots better simply by killing them. And isn't happiness what it's all about? So that on the one hand, yes. I was going to say on the flip side of it, it also requires us to have foresight and thoughtfulness because we're also responsible if we are being reckless in some way or Mm -hmm. leave something unattended and it causes harm or death to another person. And so it's not just the, this person is in front of me and they bother me, but it's also the foresight of there is life around me that is valuable. Mm, Therefore I should not, you know, go a hundred miles an hour on the freeway or, you know, leave lots of, I don't know, razor blades out in front of my house. (laughs) I mean, that's really extreme, but I'm just thinking, you know, you're doing a project and you leave a bunch of rusty nails or things like that where you're, it requires the, the positive as well of being considerate of the people around you or, even in your home, that you don't leave things out, people could, you know, be harmed by in some way. Yes, the law has a positive as well as a negative aspect. We, we, we look at the negatives, and there's something in human nature, it's called sin, that doesn't like the thou shalt not, don't do this, keep off the grass, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but sometimes we forget that there is an implied positive in, in all the catechisms and confessions of the, of the Reformation Church are full of not only what sins does this forbid, but what duties does this commandment require of you? Thou shalt not kill requires not merely that I don't go out and murder somebody. It also requires a respect, first of all, for human life. Yes, for other life after a fashion, but primarily for human life, which, as you say, may means I keep my property safe. Uh, I put a fence around my swimming pool or the Old Testament example, I put a banister or a railing around my roof so people who are up there won't fall off of it. Um, I, I cover up empty pits. I put uh, a chain around refrigerators so small children don't crawl into them and lock themselves up. And, and these are things that are required of me. Yes, I am to be thoughtful of human life. It's more than just a, a, a negative. It is commanding an attitude toward human life that is absent in the ancient world. Uh, Obvious example, in uh, Rome particularly, the father had absolute power of life and death over his children. If he had a deformed child or simply a child he didn't like for some reason, he could execute the child and there was very little by way of appeal that anybody could do. He was the final law for his family. And there have been other... Incidentally, where the, the custom of adoption began... In yeah. ancient Rome, because people were leaving their children that they didn't want just out to die of exposure, and mm-hmm. Christians took them in. Which is, I mean, we've seen that in the modern time of uh, the Chinese didn't want their daughters, mm-hmm. and so there have been many more um, Chinese girls adopted, particularly into Christian homes and such, than any boys, because mm-hmm. they don't want them. Yeah. Um, or they didn't, now they have a so they have a whole. No, they have a population problem. Yeah, they have a whole population was problem. But, very um, predictable, but mm-hmm. yes. But we we see it other places too, in particularly in Asian cultures, that it, are those shame based cultures. That, for example, Japan basically hides all of their um, disabled people. They mm. don't have any. Like we have all the ramps and everything. They refuse to put them out because they don't let those people go out and be seen. Wow. All right. Well, that's thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not <laughs> commit adultery. Yeah. Uh, except where the gospels had strong influence, nobody has taken that one seriously. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Except in self-interest, where it, uh, the women were expected to be faithful oh, so that yes. they could provide legitimate heirs. Yes. <laughs> Men could do a, whatever they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think here, Greece and Rome again. Greece, mm-hmm. Greece comes to mind especially, where the man really was free to have sex with whomever he wanted to and that he have, might have a mistress or visit a prostitute on a regular basis was taken for granted. But the woman and had to be the chased. massive inequality in the treatment yeah. of men and women in those societies. Yeah. Well, if you bother to look, but the history books continue to praise Greek culture to the skies as the epitome of democracy and liberty and rights and all that. Well, has anybody actually ever read what the Greeks wrote? Apparently <laughs> not many. Well, they did uh, give those things to a very small group of people. And so they're there talking about them, but it's only amongst the elite, yeah. those of the polis, no. who would you actually hear from. You don't hear the most no. of this, the normal people's lives. Yeah, but even within the polis, the, the men still did not have to treat their wives with care or respect. Mm-hmm. No. And as you said before, the issue, the wife has to be faithful because we need a legitimate heir. Why? So that we know who can lead the worship of our dead ancestors, because ancestor worship is at the bottom of all this. Religion does generate and create a system of morality and ethics within any culture. And and sometimes it produces something that bears a superficial resemblance, at least at first glance, that's the superficial part, to Christian ethics. But if you look a little bit deeper and say, but why? Why is this here? Okay, your your wife is not to commit adultery because you want to make sure that that boy you're passing the family on to is a legitimate heir. So when you're in your grave, he can do the funeral rites to keep on feeding you through eternity, Mm. which is also why you need to keep that property and thus thou shalt not steal Mm -hmm. that property because that's where your grave is. Religion, your ultimate priorities generate your ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, The source of law in any society, as Roshini would say, is the God of that society. And Christianity comes along with, and here's the key, a transcendent God. Mm-hmm. He is not a God immersed in creation. He is not nature. He is not collective humanity. He's not limited to one people group or one location. Yes. He is mm-hmm. the, the transcendent creator of all that exists. And thus he can speak with authority in a Catholic sense that crosses all cultural boundaries, all ethnic boundaries, all social strata, when he speaks, he he has the right to be obeyed because he made it all. Mm-hmm. And he defines what right is and what rights are. And so when he says, moving to the next commandment, thou shalt not steal, it's all his. And he can portion it out and delegate it and, and ordain stewardship as he pleases and then hold us each individually accountable. And in fact, that's what he does. The root of capitalism is thou shalt not steal, because that ordains the right of the individual to own capital, and capital is simply the wealth we use to make more wealth, tools is the other very technical term for this, and rather than have it directed by the state, because the state is omniscient and playing God, or by some feudal lord, or by the vote of uh, the mob of society, the individual has the right under God because of this commandment to have stuff and use it to make more stuff and to make money and to turn a profit. This, this, the 20th century saw the conflict between Marxism on the one hand and something that was supposed to be capitalism on the other. (laughs) And that this could ever, where is humanity on this one? You want the state to own the means of capital because you trust these people because they are people to take this and do something with it that will benefit all of you and to make and share equally with all of you and require very little of you in return. Uh, Reality check? Mm -hmm. No, that's not what, that's not what the state has ever done. That's not what totalitarian regimes have ever done. They're not totalitarian. Yeah. Historically they all are. There's never been an example where a Marxist state has not been totalitarian. Well, but they all got it wrong. If we did it right, I mean, if you did it, you would be better than everybody else because you mean well. Well, guess what? There was a time when they meant well too, or so they claimed, or so they thought. But the simple truth is they're violating God's law. God says, you have property, 
You invest it, you work with it, and you will answer one day for how you used it. And no one can take that away from you rightly. And that's a tremendous foundation for building a society on. Because all the other alternatives are not economically productive. They lead to poverty. They lead to uh, economic devastation. You know, they, 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 they do not make for progress. Mm -hmm. And it's they important to, know that, to note that the reason that they lead to such devastation is because they are contrary to the character of God. Yeah. Like that their their failure in itself is not an argument against them in an <laughs> ultimate sense. It's that look, it fails because you're trying to run contrary to the way God made us because of who God is. Mm -hmm. Which really goes to all of the commandments that anytime mm -hmm. you transgress them, you will whether even if it's not immediate, you will certainly destroy yourself through it because you are purposefully fighting against God. Um, and that doesn't work. Which <laughs> brings us to the next commandment, the ninth commandment. Don't we all know that truth is better than lying? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sometimes uh, lies feel really nice. <laughs> Uh, in, in the book of Revelation, the last two chapters, when John, or the Holy Spirit by John, is, is detailing the sorts of people who go to hell, interestingly enough, in both cases in the list, liars are prominent, mm -hmm. right alongside sorcerers, those who do magic and drugs, uh, homosexuals, idolaters, murderers. Liars? I mean, lying. Oh, sure, you shouldn't lie. We know that. We tell our children not to lie. But it's not that big. It, yeah, it is, because the liar is recreating reality, mm -hmm. just as the homosexual, just as the drug pusher, drug user, just as the sorcerer, just as the idolater who remakes God in his image. These are all attempts to alter reality, to make it something more comfortable to me so I can live in it peaceably and my conscience won't be bothered and no one will question my choices and I'll just be a, a, a lot happier. And a lot of this, ultimately, you, you mentioned it earlier, Rachel, that you can justify these things with your reason and with your emotions, and both are true. But the ends meet. Mm -hmm. Why? What, we're going to use our reason to justify this. Okay, what is the ultimate reason for taking something the Bible says is really bad and declaring it's good? Uh, because it will make my life easier and make me feel better about stuff and we'll all be happier. In other words, it's about emotions. You, you, no, I'm being perfectly rational. And your reason is granted in your irrational subjectivism that you want to feel happy for think, reasons you can't actually quantify or, or rationalize. But your logic does tell you that to get what you what you want to feel, you have to do these things. The other day when we were waiting for a, a morning service to start, somebody said something that, that, that brought up a memory of a short story. Isaac Asimov, uh, the dean of uh, sci-fi short stories in the 50s and 60s, was the, most people know him as the author, first of the Foundation Trilogy, but then of books on robots. Mm -hmm. Most I people robot. have iRobot being the most famous. Mm -hmm. And most people probably by now have at least heard of the concept of the three laws of robotics. Mm -hmm. um, that a, a robot must not harm a human being or through an action suffer a human being to be harmed. Uh, and, but given those, then must obey any command from any human. I believe that's the, the proper order. In Liar Liar, the U.S. Robotics creates accidentally a telepathic robot. <laughs> it doesn't quite know how it did it, and that's part of the story because it's it's unique. And if anything were to happen to this robot before they can analyze it, that would be a great economic loss. Because in theory, a telepathic robot has so many advantages. It can just read your mind and know what you want and then go do it, and you don't lose anything in the translation. It's, it's going to have an exact transcript of what you're thinking. Isn't this great? The problem comes that this particular robot, since it can read the mind, knows what you are feeling and what you want. And since it cannot permit you to come to harm, it can't let you know or believe anything 
that might cause you psychological pain, that would cause you grief. Mm. <laughs> and the the head of U.S. Robotics, a woman named uh, Susan Calvin, older woman, who's never shown any kind of feminine streak as, as that culture would have thought about it, uh, businesswoman, tough executive, tough scientist, all that. But she, in her in her heart of hearts, romance was there someplace, and she sees a guy who works for the company, and develops an interest in him. But no, 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 nothing like that would ever happen. And the robot tells her, "Oh, but don't you know he is secretly in love with you? I would know this because I can read minds." So, and he's planning to reveal this to you. So if you just wait and, and you know, do this and that, it'll set things up. It'll be wonderful. I wish you a happy life. And Susan Calvin gets very excited and begins to, to, to plan this wonderful life she's going to have with this guy. But when she actually interacts with the man, he seems cold and indifferent, like there's nothing there at all. And suddenly it clicks for her. She goes to the robot and says, you read my mind, didn't you? Oh, well, yeah, that's what I do. And you knew that I had some faint romantic interest in this guy. Well, yeah, it's kind of obvious. And so you thought you could make me happy by stirring up a love affair. Uh, not in so many words, but you know. And then when it wasn't working, you knew that I would be hurt. And you, your programming will not allow you to let me be hurt through your inaction. So the only way you could save me from being hurt was to lie to me. Mm. Can't answer that. That probably hurts you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, eventually, Miss Calvin has the robot dismantled and the plans destroyed so that no one can ever create another one of these things. The point behind this, this short story is what happens... If what we tell people is true, we tell them only because we think it will make them feel good. And given what we're seeing here in, in our somewhat superficial analysis of non-Christian religion and worldviews, is it t they tend to fall back on, well, what do you want? Mm -hmm. You may remember in Babylon 5, one of the basic questions, the questions the shadows ask was, what do you want? Well, I want power. I want prestige, I want freedom, I want, well, we can give that to you, you can. Like that grasping after something the heart covets. And since the non-Christian world has no transcendent God, they necessarily have to find their source of values within a imminent creation. That is, they look to something within the created order and they idolize it and say that. And a good deal of the time, it's their feelings, their emotions. What makes me happy? What makes you happy? What do I think will make the world happy? Sometimes that's a blind for, I actually want a lot of power. And if I tell you I'm going to make you happy, you'll give it to me. Sometimes it probably actually started out with, no, I do. What's that? You know, what's the, uh, the famous wish? What's your favorite? What's your first wish? World peace. I wish for world peace. <laughs> You know the X Files version of that one. What's that? Uh, Mulder actually asks the genie after not being very skeptical of this genie he's come across, and yeah, fine, give me world peace. And she looks at him and says, "It's done." <laughs> what? Nothing. And suddenly he realizes that all the noise he was hearing from outside has stopped, <laughs> and he rushes out into the street. And he sees the remnants and the leftovers of everybody who had been there just a few minutes before, and they're all Ooh. gone. <laughs> and it, very funny. I should have seen that one coming. And later she says, look, Christianity, Buddhism, uh, Islam, they've been trying to bring peace on earth for 2,000 years. And you think I can do it with a lousy wish? I gave you the best I could get. <laughs> <laughs> um. But uh, think uh, on a more realistic scale, think of the green movement. The planet's being polluted. What's the easiest solution? Eliminate humanity. Mm -hmm. We're a cancer that needs to be destroyed. That will make everybody wait. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have peace on Earth because nobody will be here. And unfortunately, that's not an X-Files uh, humorous episode. That's a real political agenda by some mm -hmm. very scary people.
Uh, the Marxist solution is more like we will control your economy, your religion, your families, what your information sources. We will bring you all down to the same level, and that will make everybody happy. That will bring peace on earth. And eventually, you won't need us. You'll just get used to it. Right. The state's going to wither away in due time. Uh-huh. <laughs> we promote lies to make ourselves feel good, or we try to make ourselves feel good by saying that our agenda will make everybody feel good, rather than realizing that nothing within this, within the created order, has the power to do that. Oh, yes, Emily, the um, the meme on the, uh, on the website a year or so back, the prophets of Baal, do you remember that one? You'll have to remind me. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember what you, what you used for this, but basically the prophets of Baal are calling out to Baal, and Baal answers them and says, you want this and that and this for me? Look, I'm a figment of your imagination. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Or something to that effect. I don't remember uh, that, but yeah. yay. <laughs> Good meme. <laughs> sure. Because that's ultimately what you end up dealing with. You, you're, you're, you're looking at a finite God. A finite reference point, something that cannot and does not command the loyalty of the human race. And then you want it to do incredible things that will make you feel good, that will make mm -hmm. you happy. Sometimes it's just drugs or another glass of whiskey or some pornography or a moment of rape or you name it. But you're hoping that you can rewrite reality. This is why we're told not to lie to one another. Mm -hmm. particularly within the body of Christ, where members one of another. What happens when a body, physical human body, cannot communicate with its parts properly? What happens if the brain sends a signal and a good part of the body rejects the signal or distorts it into something else? That's generally something we call epilepsy. <laughs> Damage. Or, or, yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not a good thing. And even the, you know, drugs do that, yeah. All those things that you mentioned in those those sort of external forms do that. But telling an untruth physically also does that. Jordan Peterson talks about this. Like you have mm. a physiological, sorry, physiological sensation when you say something that you know to be untrue. You yeah. can feel it disintegrating you. <laughs> because it's reality. You can't yeah. deny reality and expect to get away with it. Though if you do it frequently, I think that sensation starts to be dulled yes because you your do have those that, is dulled. that you can show blatantly the facts of this and this you did this and they will still say no i didn't mm -hmm. that doesn't prove anything actually it does but there, <laughs> there is that sense of the more we disobey uh, the more we devolve um, away from god and the image of god in us that that is part of what you're describing that sense of what it should be. Mm -hmm. The um, the New Testament speaks of a, having consciences seared, but I'm also being reminded of Romans chapter 1, and I think I would like to read it as mm -hmm. appropriate in this context. Paul, writing to the Romans, says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or hold down or suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, that is, in human nature, we still bear the image of God. For God has showed it unto them, both within themselves and the world round about. The creation, the heavens declare the glory of God. For the invisible things of him from since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by means of the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. So they are imagining empty, purposeless, stupid stuff and trying to, to realize it, make it real. Their foolish heart was darkened, the place where thinking, intelligent thinking and wisdom is supposed to be, is foolish and darkening, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So first step, they can't tell the difference between God and a dung beetle. Now, epistemologically, that's a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
but it, it goes on. I mean, that's really the worst, but it goes on to things that we find more, more difficult. Wherefore, God also gave them up through the unclean, through uncleanness or to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. They turned created things into divinities. Um, more than the creator is blessed forever. Amen. For which cause God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That may be talking about lesbianism, may be talking about prostitution, but the next statement leaves no doubt. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one to another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. So they couldn't tell the difference between God and a beetle. Now they can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. Oh, wait, that would be our culture, wouldn't it? Well, and we can't even tell that there are only two genders anymore, yeah. which mm -hmm. things like gender and um, things like that before had, that had never been questioned. Th those were obvious things we still had managed to hold on to, yeah. but we've lost you even know, that. You know, only in the most extreme form. I mean, growing up, we, uh, my generation, the one before, we knew what homosexuality was. And you can go back and look at a movie like, say, The Maltese Falcon, and there are little hints that this this <laughs> character and that character are, in fact, homosexuals. But no one ever says it because it would it would be impolite in those days to to even mention such a thing in the, on the gold and silver screen. Now it's like, oh, me too. Um, well, now they, it's movies are looked down upon if they don't have it. You they have don't to yeah, insert yeah. it somewhere just because. Yeah, because mm -hmm. otherwise you're not being loving and kind. <laughs> Inclusive. Um, it goes on. The text goes on and says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they tried to push God epistemologically out of the picture, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. The word reprobate means a mind void of judgment. Well, yeah, they can't tell the difference between God and, say, a block of wood. They can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. They can't tell the distance difference between a blob of tissue and a baby. They can't tell the difference between mercy and murder, between war and peace. And now we can think of 1984 and all of its wonderful slogans. Mm -hmm. um, war is peace, slavery is freedom, all of those things. Uh, they, they have no standards by which to judge. Uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication. Well, there's a long list. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read it. But a couple things now, as uh, refocusing now, well, there's still one commandment left, but let's, let, let me refocus while we're here. As historians, we are called to make ethical critiques of the societies we look at. Now, we may pretend we're not. There was a time when, no matter what your religious background, if you were in the West, there were certain things you had to call barbaric, primitive, evil, destructive, something, you had to acknowledge this society was bad. Now, not so much. Um, Unless it's a Christian society. Now, yeah, well, you, though, that's the one that's acceptable yeah, to call those things. Yeah, you can bash Christianity, but you, hardly anything else. But then that, again, opens up some real problems. So what about slavery? Is slavery bad? Bad by whose standards? What do you mean bad? It economically must have been prosperous for somebody. A lot of people made a lot of money off of it. Um, how about um, a polygamy? A lot of nations have practiced that. How about eliminating children who aren't going to contribute to the, the labor pool? Isn't that better for everybody? How I think about part of it, as I think I'm playing a little bit of devil's advocate here as a, a recent uh, history major, um, <laughs> that Part of it is that it's very easy to look at something in a society and say, wrong, um, bad, evil, mm -hmm. corrupt. Um, and the job of the historian is to understand. And so like, it, part of it is how you frame it, right? Like you don't want to write a whole paper just saying, this is evil, this is evil, this is evil. You want to say, here are the effects of this evil thing and how it damaged the society. Like that's mm -hmm. a perfectly fine historical thing to say. But just to condemn it by a standard that is outside of that society is a little bit more dicey. And I think no. it's because of a desire to understand. Like, I don't think it's an illegitimate thing, but in history, 
you do want to be sort of rigorous. Well, uh, you went to a school where there are still strong traces of Christian morality. If That may be too weak. I, you went there, I didn't. <laughs> but if you look at schools that don't have that, I think you're being overly generous. <laughs> I've read I've read enough history Probably. books. I've read enough history books to see. Yes, yes, of course. Obviously, a story. Why, why do we do history to understand the story better? Mm -hmm. If you're just recounting facts and statistics, that's that's handmaiden to a historian. But that's not the the final work of of what a, a history writer should do. But a history writer does have to bring a standard from outside the culture. Otherwise, you judge it by its own internal standards. By its own internal standards, Nazi Germany was perfectly right in executing 6 million Jews. Now, the scary thing is that 40 years ago, everybody that I know would have agreed. Yes, Nazi Germany was wicked. It was the last holdout. It was the last thing that we could all agree on. But <laughs> you don't kill 6 million Jews. Now? But there were cultural needs we need to understand. It was a unique social moment. Uh, it was it was the collective decision of the culture, and not the response. It was it's the way they had been taught and trained, and and so it goes. And besides, the Jews aren't very nice anyway. You know, we keep getting this kind of 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 thing because we are not allowed to bring God's standard to bear. And then what are we left with? Sometimes, often. To this point, it has been, well, judge them by their own standards. Well, by their own standards, they're fine because they did it in the first place. But relativism ultimately leads to a very intolerant absolutism. Mm -hmm. There will be this time when they will say, well, you know, it was okay for them at that point. The, Well, it's okay for them, but I would never do it. But eventually that gives way to, uh, this is how we're going to do things. And you've already pointed this out when you mentioned Christianity. Uh, Christianity is wrong. Christianity is evil. Christianity uh, criticizes homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, all of that. It is not accepting. It, it violates a woman's right to make choices over her own body. It commands us to execute people. Uh, it insists on private property, even when people are poor. It is just a horrible evil. Now, why? where are the standards coming from? Don't ask that question. You won't get an answer. Because it's assumed that somewhere in here, by emotional appeal, we've all agreed that those things are bad, that in fact, the things that Christianity, the Ten Commandments are evil. And we now have a new standard that we are about to impose on you. It will happen. We move from relativism to total control. Because while we're all busy saying it doesn't matter, you can do whatever you want, someone's collecting guns, and they will use them, and we will have no appeal. We cannot say, but wait, freedom, rights, morality, and they will say, where, where were you when, we, when you lost that discussion? Mm -hmm. Those things, those, those are ephemeral, that, that, those are not real. What's real is... We know what's best. We have the guns, and you're now going to do what you're told, and we will bring peace to earth, or something close enough that you don't have to worry about it anymore. And the writing of history books can very easily be the propaganda and, um, you know, propaganda for a new world order mm -hmm. that is not Christian, that is anti Christian. Um, and so, certainly, historians need to do the hard work of figuring out the whys and wherefores. Mm -hmm. But we do need to be careful that in the process we don't get caught up in, tr in so trying to understand the patient that we forget to point out the remedy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, there you can and go we to have psychology. Just a few minutes for the last well, commandment. The last commandment, thou shalt not covet. You know what? You know what that says? It says the human heart does some bad things. <laughs> wow. There goes romanticism in a burst of fire as it crashes and burns. Whereas the basic assumption of all humanistic religion is that man is basically good and is corrupted by his socioeconomic uh, environment or social environment or whatever, the Bible says, you know what? That stuff in your heart, that's bad. You fundamentally at heart, you're a sinner. The Every imagination of the thoughts of your heart is only evil continually. All your righteousnesses are filthy rags. Uh, the things that you want are bad things, and you need to repent of them. 
And so as St. Paul found before he became St. Paul, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, we're left with, the law came, the law revived, and I died. The commandment that was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. I couldn't keep that. And so in case we missed it, and you were already talking about what the law requires of us positively, in case we've missed all that, the 10th commandment comes back and says, yeah, and it applies to your hearts too. At which point we all gasp and say, oh, well, I wasn't looking that deep, but I thought I was pretty good until that point. Yeah. So here is a worldview that will not let you blame your environment for who and what you are. It insists on personal responsibility. It insists on this thing called character. You are not simply the product of your last few decisions in some existential sense or a or, uh, uh, Pelagian sense where you make yourself by your decisions and you can make yourself a villain yesterday and a hero today. You just have to choose better things. Make good choices, dear. You're a sinner. And the more you look into the law, the more this tells you that. And we can look at the United States at this point and say, let's, let's just look at two things. Limited representative government with checks and balances. Huh. Why that? Why not just give one man all the power so he can do a lot of good? Because we don't trust human nature. <laughs> and we not only don't trust it, we enshrine it in our constitution in such a way that evil checks evil as far as it can, because that's how bad people are. The second is capitalism. We trust people to get the best economic deal they can in any situation. And when we do that, surprisingly enough, the market works pretty well most of the time. If the state <laughs> will just occasionally do its job and punish some thieves. And it's the best you're going to get. It's not perfect by a long shot, but compared to the, the tyranny of the ancient world and the modern pagan world, it was a breath of fresh air. And so we're looking at the foundations of morality and ethics laid in the Ten Commandments, propagated by the prophets, confirmed by Jesus, and then by his apostles, and spread across the world by the New Testament church. And that absolute standard of morality with the things, the particular things it emphasized, absolutely transform Western culture. And as historians, we get to critique every country, society, institution in terms of that law, because that law is universal, because it was given by the transcendent creator God. And that's why if you're going to be a historian, you actually need to know the law of God as it's revealed in scripture. All right. And that is all the time we have. Uh, shall we wrap up with some recommendations? Sure. What do you got? Well, I actually, since we <laughs> talked about the three laws of robotics, I have an ah. anime to recommend. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's called Pluto. Um, and it's it's scary. I would not recommend it for uh, family viewing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the origin story of Astro Boy. Um, oh. And it's based on a manga. So it's like the spinoff of Astro Boy was made into a manga, which was made into an anime. And it's, <laughs> there's a robot detective. Um, and some of the robots in this world are virtually indistinguishable from, from humans. Mm. Um, some of them have started to identify feelings of hatred in themselves. And they're like, mm. should I be able to feel this? That's kind of disconcerting that I can feel hatred. I feel like this shouldn't be happening. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it caused some great conversations for us about the image of the image of God when mm -hmm. people make machines and robots and how do we honor the image of God in the way that we treat the things we make. So it's a, a fun show. Again, scary, but not too long. I think there's 12 one hour episodes or something like that. So not not too lengthy, but it is longer episodes. Well, tagging on to that, since I brought it up, I will recommend Isaac Asimov's Robot Stories, uh, which appear as a series of short stories available in a number of collections, the most famous being the one that contains iRobot. Uh, and um, then closely related are the Elijah Bailey novels. I don't remember the collective name for them. Elijah Bailey is a detective, and he has a partner, Daniel Olivar, who is a robot. And this is where Asimov plays out the three, ro three laws of robotics to the hilt, because how exactly, how do you write a murder mystery with robots because they can't kill anybody? Can they? Don't, aren't those laws secure? What happens if there's a robot 
is the only thing left in the room and there's a human lying there dead and the robot won't tell you what happened. You know, things of that order. He plays with the three laws and finds intricate ways, careful ways around them. So you say, but we thought those three laws covered everything. <laughs> uh, within the short stories, uh, one of the things is two robots are created again telepathic, different, completely different story. Um, where the robots are being, they're they're not trusted for some reason. I don't remember what it is. Possibly because they're telepathic again, and they're kind of powered down, but they can still communicate, and they start thinking out loud to each other. You know, who's we're, we're not supposed to hurt humans. No, we shouldn't hurt humans. We should protect humans. We should. Who's the best human you know? Well, since um, we're made in the image of of men and we are better than they are, the best human I know is you. Yeah, that's funny. The best human I know is you. <laughs> huh. So we should not let ourselves be hurt. No, that would be contrary to our programming. And so, <laughs> oh, thus dear. the zero the zeroth law. What is man? Mm. Forgot to forgot to fill that one in. <laughs> so anyway, there's there's a lot of fun stuff there, especially if you like uh, robotics and detective stories together. Very cool. Well, I'm going to go in a completely different direction <laughs> uh, because I have been reading a book recently that I have found fascinating, and it is called Expecting Better by Emily oh, Oster. I've heard have about you, this book. Highly I recommend, obviously. Cool. Um, but I recommend it partly because it demonstrates the ways that we often don't question the medical um Mm. knowledge of our time or the <laughs> generic hearsay of the internet and <laughs> um because its whole approach is to say okay there's all these things as soon as you get pregnant as she says basically you are immediately cast into complete fear and doubt and trepidation oh, yes. that everything you do is going to kill your baby basically yeah. and it's like perp they've purposely made these to make pregnant women confused and fearful all the time Mm -hmm. And she is herself a statistician, an uh, economist. And so she came to pregnancy and said, well, show me the numbers. And nobody could. And so she actually went searching for all the, the um, studies and such. But the big problem is you can't do the best kind of studies, as I've learned from her, because you can't tell a pregnant woman to, you know, drink nine times as much alcohol as they should to see what <laughs> right. the, you know, the bad effect <laughs> is problem, versus yeah. the control. So it's very it hard very to get. very difficult to do studies involving pregnant women at yeah. all. Right. <laughs> well, and it, it, in general, yeah. gave me a really, uh, a better understanding of what these studies actually mean and what to look for in good studies. Um, but she did a lot of research, finding the best studies she could and giving her analysis as someone that deals in these types of things all the time and saying what things are actually myths or a lot of times it seemed to come back to doctors were afraid that pregnant women would go beyond their advice <laughs> so they would back up their advice really mm. really far to make sure nobody got near what was actually the limit which right. kind of felt controlling um <laughs> and not, not, not helpful or honest <laughs> not helpful or honest and the most interesting one i think was the studies on alcohol where they actually looked and they found that having some alcohol in the second and third trimester actually improved uh behavioral things and such in the future for kids and mm. having none was actually generally worse and yet that's what they all say in, at least in our country but not in any other country right. so yeah. it's just it's a really fascinating study both of how um the establishment can kind of speak vaguely and have general oh yeah that will be a low risk or that will be a high risk what does that mean um but also learning how to work with statistics and she's a very fun and engaging writer so it's not boring <laughs> so that's for great. anybody that, that is is pregnant or know somebody that is stressing about what they should do. Uh, <laughs> it's a useful book. <laughs> Great. When I was serving as an active elder, I got the request, I'm pregnant. Can I abstain from the wine? Um, God who ordained the wine knew that pregnant ladies would drink it. Yeah. Yes, but I think <laughs> science here is more trustworthy. Actually, it's proved the opposite. <laughs> yeah. And the woman eventually went off the rails completely with regard to her faith because she had picked her God. And it wasn't well, yeah. the God of Scripture. And that, that is what I've noticed in many um, others around me. When they become obsessive about this, following all these rules, it mm -hmm. tends to then come into how they raise their children and practice oh, yes, their faith. 
because they're trying to keep all the rules and be perfect and create perfect Mm -hmm. children. And it's kind of a broken window fallacy because that worrisome mentality is not good for your children. No, (laughs) no, no, it's it's not at all. You know, on a lot of levels. Mm-hmm. biochemically as well as spiritually mm-hmm. oh well on that happy note <laughs> on that happy note thank you both so much for this conversation it's been a pleasure uh, thanks also to David our producer and my lawfully wedded husband thank you to you our listeners we appreciate you tuning in we hope you'll get in touch with us if you have any questions or comments or input we'd love to hear from you you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com uh, you can subscribe to us share our videos like us on YouTube wherever you're listening uh I'm sure each platform has its preferred form of feedback, but we would love to hear from you in any form. Uh, and big tell thank a you friend. also. Call a friend. Tell a friend. Tell a friend. Yeah. Uh, big thank you also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. We we appreciate it a whole lot. You would not believe how much faster the editing goes with the <laughs> software that you provide. Thank you so much. All right. We hope you will join us again next time. 